Perfect. Okay. So um, I'll just introduce myself. I don't need that fancy introduction. My name is AJ Hale. I uh, am a certified cardiac device specialist. And today we'll be talking about pacemaker timing cycles. Um, you know, obviously we're going to be going over um, actual EGM and real life examples. And if you have any questions as we go, feel free to raise your hand. We'll be monitoring the chat. Um, reach out, use a Q&A, however you'd like to. We can also give you permission to talk. We'd love to hear from you. This doesn't have to be, you know, a one-sided thing. And we'd rather we can we can communicate and figure out a way to, to grow and move forward. So to start off with here, I'm going to go ahead and do a pop quiz for the folks in attendance here. So pop quiz. Question one, what is happening in this EGM? So what are you observing here in this EGM? That'll be question one. Question two has the same exact questions as well. So I'll show you that once you've had time to review this slide. What do you think is occurring here? Jared, are you seeing the pop quiz on your side? Yeah, I'm seeing the pop quiz now. I've got the EGM with the questions on the left, answers on the left, sorry. Perfect. And then something pops up where you can actually vote on it, correct? Yeah, it did pop up, but it's disappeared for me. So I'm not sure if the other colleagues have got that. Huh. Okay. Let me restart that one more time. Okay. Well, tell you what, it's not going to work. So Let's go ahead and take a look at this first EGM here. We're still a work in progress with our pop quizzes. Um, Jared, do you want to take a shot at what's occurring here? Or anyone in the chat want to chime in? Okay, well, plain and simple, we just have, uh, is just pacemaker wiki box. So, um, Looking at this, you're wondering why we're having these random dropped events, why you know, you're know you not having the steady ventricular rate, why you have the steady atrial rate, but you're not tracking it. Um, this is just normal device um, activity based upon the programming that it has. What is occurring is the device has the max uh, track rate or the fastest rate with, with which the device will track what's happening in the atrium. The atrial rate is exceeding that max track rate. And what the device will do is it will continue to pace at the max track at this nice steady rhythm. And in the behavior that manifests is an extended AV delay every single time until eventually the atrial event falls into the atrial refractory period, the PVARP right here. This causes the device to not actually track the atrial event, but it does count it towards mode switch, which is why you see this little tick mark. And then obviously there's no corresponding ventricular tracked event the next atrial event falls outside of the atrial refractory. So the device tracks it with a normal AV delay. And this process continues on again. Once the atrial rate actually drops below the max track rate, you will see one-to-one -one atrial synchrony. But when you start having these upper rate behaviors, as they're called, you'll end up having something called pacemaker winky bach. This acts exactly like you'd see the AV nodal winky bach, or at least a surrogate of that. Any uh, any thoughts on that, Jared, at all? No, no, that's perfect, mate. That's really good. Perfect. Yeah, so I thought this is a good example and kind of leads into what we're seeing next. How about this next one here? What are we seeing that's occurring? Anybody want to take a crack at it? We do have a chat. You can post your answers in the chat. All right, so if we're simply going to diagnose what's occurring, if you look here, this is your ventricular channel. Channel three is your vSense amp. Typically, I would have a far field and not a leadless ECG. If you've ever worked with me in the field, I absolutely despise leadless ECG. I think that it confuses and convolutes things. And I like to use a unipolar tip elect or, um, vector instead for my EGM. However, you can see here the ventricular activity a nice steady ventricular rhythm. You see bivy pacing occurring with no evoked response on the SenseAmp channel. 
um, this indicates to me that this is loss of uh, ventricular capture. So um, not ideal. And I would recommend probably increasing your outputs considering this is a bi -V and neither seem to be programming. Um, I would, uh, uh, before we do any immediate troubleshooting, it would be increasing the outputs and seeing what kind of thresholds we have. Uh, you may need a chest X-ray. There may be a number of different factors uh, to look into this, but for whatever reason, you're not able to capture it all in the ventricle. Do you have any thoughts on that, Jared? No, I totally agree. And I, I think there's also clearly an issue going on with the atrial lead as well. We've got loss of atrial capture as well. Yep, dead on. Yep. So, um, and again, as what AJ was saying about the leadless ECG, I agree. Uh, the first thing I do is turn it off. It uh, can be misleading. And, and even just as simple as um, if you were to have an ECG, have it at the top and then maybe your atrial and ventricular EGMs next to each other. So it's a little bit easier to track one to one. So you can kind of walk through and see is there a, a V to every A and just try and get a pattern here. But, um, but yeah, you can see that on the atrial channel, you get those big spikes. That's just probably the sinus rate coming through. And then uh, and then you try to see the pacemaker trying to pace, but it's not capturing. Most likely because the atrium's in refractory from the previous sinus beat. Um, so yeah, that's uh, we've got both loss of atrial and ventricular capture there. Yeah, so dead on. I, I completely agree with you. And I would say, you know, the atrium is probably at a refractory for a few of these and it's not capturing at all. So yeah, there's definitely something going on. So yeah, as Jared said, I would get rid of this. And then what I like to do is I actually like to move my marker channel here in between and then my ventricular channel here. So then the tick mark in the A points to the A, the tick mark in the V points to the V, and then I'll have a unipolar, um, uh, EGM here that shows me the evoked response across the myocardium. Remember that your sense amps, these right here are going to be a near field, um, like an unfiltered bipolar. And it's great to see what the device is seeing with the sense amp, but for actual diagnosis of what's going on, it's not ideal. You really can't tell the difference between a PVC and a intrinsic event using a sense amp channel, uh, not well at least. So yeah. All right, so we'll go ahead and jump right into it then. Uh, so we're gonna be talking about timing cycles. So uh, just to go over the basic timing cycles we're gonna see here, you have refractory periods, uh, which is where the device can see the signals, but it does not respond to them. This would be your PVARP, this would be your VREF. Uh, you have blanking periods. This is where the device completely has its eyes shut. It's not paying attention to what's happening at all. Uh, this would be your PVAB, postventricular atrial blanking, um, and uh, the ventricular blanking or V-blanking period. And then finally, alert period, and that is the time when the device has its eyes completely open to respond to any kind of intrinsic activity or any kind of activity that can occur, not just intrinsic, unfortunately. So we'll jump straight into atrial timing cycles. The first one, uh, the one you're going to see a lot is paced AV delay, sensed AV delay, so it's your AV delays. Um, I just went ahead and visualize it here on an Abbott programmer and a Medtronic programmer, um, but this is the most common one you're going to be programming. Um, so AV, AV delay is in a patient um, who requires V pacing. So AV delay, um, basically it occurs, um, the AV delay, it, it occurs after an atrial event, either paced or sensed, and it allows time for um, diastolic filling and then also allows time for intrinsic conduction to occur. Uh, as we've talked about in the past, you were trying our best to avoid ventricular um, pacing induced cardiomyopathy, so ventricular pacing. So in these instances, proper AV delay programming is ideal. So here we'll just see we have a sensed um, atrial event. You have it, it kicks off what's your called your sensed AV delay, which um, generally is a little bit shorter than your paced AV delay. The reason being that by the time you start to sense an atrial event, you probably have some degree um, of the atrial event already having occurred because you don't sense it right when it initiates, depending where in the atrium the lead is placed. Um, so you have a slight delay. So you tend to have your sensed AV delay just a little bit shorter than your paced AV delay. So if we're looking here at an EKG, this is not an EGM. You see a P wave. It initiates the sensed AV delay clock. This clock times out, you ventricular pace. 
Same thing occurs here, occurs here, occurs here. We're just tracking what's happening in the atrium. Finally, um, it waits for the intrinsic atrial event to occur. Nothing occurs. So then it initiates a atrial pace. This initiates the paced AV delay, which like I said, is just a little bit longer. It's waiting for the intrinsic ventricular event to occur. It does not. So it ventricular paces, it waits again, nothing occurs. Atrial paces sets the paced AV delay, nothing occurs if ventricular paces. Remember that your pacemaker is just a bunch of different clocks that all start and stop at different times. But um, so whenever you say atrial pace, you're starting the clock waiting to see when the next atrial event occurs. You're also starting the clock waiting to see when the ventricular event occurs. Uh, so just keep in mind that we're just taking into account one more clock. Okay, so patients who have intrinsic conduction, um, it allows for those R waves to come across. So we're here looking at this um, surface EKG. You have your atrial paced event, your paced AV delay, nothing occurs, ventricular pace. You have your uh, sensed atrial events, starts the sensed AV delay, nothing occurs, so at ventricular paces. Here we have a sensed atrial event, there is no, or there is an occurrence of a um, intrinsic ventricular event, and you can tell by the morphology. You can tell because there's no pacer spike. Um, this will go ahead and withhold the um, ventricular pace that might have occurred right around here, and it allows for uh, intrinsic ventricular activity to occur. The timer continues. No atrial event occurs, so you have an atrial pace, ventricular pace. Common sense, but I think it's good to go through it with a little bit of imaging here. Do you have anything to add on that, Jared? No, the only thing I was going to say is that you, you do see it a lot. Is they're, they're, they're the tricky ones, those ones there where you've got a patient that is pacing in the ventricle quite often, but also has good intrinsic rhythm uh, conduction and trying to program the AVD, AV delay because we obviously we always want to minimize ventricular pacing where possible. So there's a big habit that a lot of people extend the AB delays out to like 300 milliseconds, which in theory is, is very long first degree heart block. So, but then when they do get into heart block, they're now pacing at a very long AB delay. So, and that can cause things like cannon waves, et cetera. So we just got to be careful about programming AB delays. Um, there are fancy kind of programming methods around that um, with things like AAI and DDD. Um, so if you can use those kind of features in the device, then do so. It means that you can always program kind of, I say, normal AV delays, something like paste 180, sense 150, something like that, uh, without having to extend those AV delays out to 300 to minimize ventricular pacing. No, that's dead on. And as you were saying, AAI, uh, those would be your V. Uh excuse me, your VIP and your MVP algorithms. Uh, so MVP is Medtronic, uh, VIP is Abbott. And what these are uh, meant to do is they're a dynamic algorithm that will extend the AV delay when the patient is conducting. And then when the patient is not conducting, it shortens the AV delay up to be more hemodynamic. Um, so you still get your atrial kick. Uh, you still get, you know, uh, the the benefit of your uh, of your atrial activity. But then when they do conduct, it does extend it out to allow the intrinsic conduction. And I've never gotten a straight answer from a physician on which is better. You know, if, if it's better to have a 450 second or millisecond um, AV delay with conduction or better to have a tighter uh, paced event. Um, I've heard both answers, but a lot of people say that obviously you want to avoid the V pacing because pacemaker induced cardiomyopathy is no fun. Okay, so that brings us on to PVAR. So um, we've talked about this before, but we're going to go over the actual PVARP or postventricular atrial refractory um, uh, programming here. So the postventricular atrial refractory period essentially is a time where the device it will not respond to a retrograde um, atrial activity. So um, you might have heard of pacemaker mediated tachycardia (PMT). PMT occurs when you have a ventricular pace. The uh, Atrium is out of refractory period. The ventricular event runs retrograde to the atrium. And then that is sensed by the device. 
causing it to then V pace. So you see here on this EKG, we have an A pace, V pace, A pace, V pace. We have a PVC that occurs. And then we have a, looks like a P wave right here buried in that PVC. The device sees this P wave, thinks that it's a true atrial event when in reality, it just ran retrograde up the AV node. The device then tracks that atrial event, ventricular paces, you have your retrograde event, the device sees it again, ventricular paces. And this is basically creating an endless loop tachycardia, but it's device mediated. And the only way to really break this up is certain algorithms or um, proper programming of PVARP. So uh, I would see this a lot of times when I worked in rural settings where, pro where patients were not properly programmed and their PVARP was too short, especially their rate responsive PVARP. And patients would have a retrograde conduction of say 375 milliseconds and PVARP is set to 325 milliseconds. Well, it's not gonna do you any good then. The device still has its eyes open and as a result, it tracks those events. So we're looking at, um, Actually, I don't know if I have an EGM of PVARP. We'll go over that a little bit more in detail, though, later in the uh, presentation. Do you have anything to add on that for me, Jerry? No, just no. I was just going to say with PVARPs, um, to get a to get well, sorry, with PVARP and PMT, more importantly, PMT. To have a PMT, you you need to have usually two things, and one of them is a retrograde conduction. So if your patients don't have retrograde conduction, then you're not going to have a PMT. Um, because you need that retrograde beat to go back up to the atrium to initiate it. So um, if they don't have retrograde conduction and you see these tachycardias, then the chances are it's actually an atrial tachycardia, uh, maybe a slow atrial tachycardia conducting at the uh, upper tracking rate. And usually you see PMTs in patients with complete half lock who don't or and or who don't have good AV conduction because uh, usually it's a paste mediated tachycardia. It's not a a sense, V sense. So usually they're the two things that you see. A re you need to have retrograde conduction and you need to have either usually half block or some kind of sluggish AV conduction. Dead on. Um, and then another thing to mention here is that um, a lot of times when you read uh, the manuals, they'll say that uh, PMT occurs at the max track rate. That's That can be true, but PMT um, is actually a function of your sensed AV delay timing and your retrograde conduction timing added together. So if you have very long retrograde conduction and you have a very long sensed AV delay, you can have PMT below the max track rate. Um, and that may actually come up in the IVHRE for those who, who take that test. So don't just assume because we're seeing what looks like PMT, but it's only occurring at say 100 beats a minute instead of 120, which is the program max track rate, that it's not PMT. Um, it very well could be if they have long retrograde and you've programmed long sense day V delays. Yeah, that's a really good point. Okay, so we have PVAB. So that brings us on to the next. This is your post-ventricular atrial blanking. Remember, blanking means the device has its eyes completely closed. Um, so PVAB is meant to avoid what's called far field R waves. And this is actually the device sensing the ventricular event on the atrial channel. This isn't a retrograde. This is actually like an antenna picking up interference from what's occurring down below in the ventricle. So uh, what can happen here is the device will, uh, will double count these atrial events, and this can lead to a lot of mode switches for no reason at all. Um, it's not really necessarily as detrimental as other forms of, um, of oversensing, but it's definitely something to be aware of. And it's why you want to program your, your PVAB out longer. And we'll go through an actual example of where it could be complicated later. But just remember that the far field R waves that are occurring, they're oversensed ventricular events it's not actually a true event that's happening in the atrium. And you can see here on this example, you have your atrial sensed event, you have your ventricular pace. It actually, or it obviously um, uh, depolarizes the ventricle. And then you see this little atrial spike here occurring in line with the ventricular depolarization. This is your um, far R occurring. Okay, so this is actually a little confusing because PVAB and PVARP technically start at the same time. So um, this is just a way to kind of visualize when it's going, but PVAB is usually shorter than PVARP, or PVAB is shorter than PVARP. Um, so your PVAB will occur as soon as you have your ventricular pace. Um, 
same thing as PVARP. Those clocks are started at the same time. Your PVAB extends out and then will terminate, I don't know what, 80 milliseconds or so after, depending on how it's programmed, 80 to 150, something like that. Um, and then your PVARP extends out to try to avoid uh, double counting any kind of retrograde events that occur. So these are just these two visualized right next to each other. Um, just remember that PVAB means the device is completely blind to anything occurring in the atrium at this time. And then PVARP, its eyes are open, but it's not going to track in DDD mode. Um, and this just keeps it from entering into a pacemaker-mediated tachycardia. Any thoughts on that? No, mate, that's good. I actually, my implant yesterday, I did an implant yesterday, as I mentioned, that we actually had far field... Uh far field R waves on the uh, atrial channel um, and just with the right programming. And if you've got, uh, by changing the sensitivity, we can program around it, but it's just very, uh, for those implanters out there, just be careful when you are implanting your RA lead that you're not putting those bipole electrodes too close to that mitral uh, tricuspid valve because that's when you can pick up um, those far field R waves. So it's just, a, you know, if you can keep that RA lead a little bit higher where possible, then you can usually uh, limit the amount of, these uh over sensing on that atrial channel oh, that uh, i appreciate that yeah so placement is is definitely key and it's also something to be aware as people who are programming um if you see where the device is where the lead is being placed take into account that it may cause trouble when you hook up to the programmer so uh, be ready to see that all right so scenario one things to consider while we're looking at the cgm what rhythm is the patient in what is the device why did the device mode switch what issue is occurring why are there atrial refractory or why are there AR events on the marker channel? And then what uh, programming solutions can address this issue? So show you this EGM here and give you a little bit of time to reflect on it. I think this is your first time seeing it, Jared, so I won't quiz you too hard on it. No, that's cool. I, know. I like it. So here is slide one. Here is slide two. All right, so let's go ahead and jump into it here. So uh, what rhythm is a patient in? Sinus bradycardia with ventricular pacing. What is the device? It's a pacemaker. And then why did the device mode switch? So it's far field over sensing of the ventricular paced event on the atrial channel. Um, and then the patient's intrinsic atrial activity. So if we take a look here at these EGMs again, you can see here that we have a V-pace. Corresponding with this V-pace, you have this little atrial event here, and it looks like this is a steady atrial rhythm, but when you actually march things out, these are occurring just in line with the ventricular event. And then you have this totally different morphology here, uh, much higher amplitude events here that are occurring very steadily right here. So what you're seeing here, these AR events, are the true atrial intrinsic activity. These right here, this is your far R. Why this is obviously an issue is because this device here is thinking that this is the intrinsic atrial activity and it's trying to follow along with what's going on here. Um, in these cases, this is when you need to extend your PVAB out. And we'll go back to the answer question or the answer piece. I just want to show you this some more. Once again, AR, this is your true atrial activity. This is your far R occurring in line with every ventricular pace. You see here, this is not, these true intrinsic are not affected by the um, these false atrial events here. It's just this nice, steady sinus bradycardia. Then eventually, when the device has enough of these competing events, these um, far R and then the true atrial activity, obviously the AR, A and refractory, means it's counting towards mode switch because it's still within PVARP. It will go into auto mode switch. When an auto mode switches, it breaks this cycle where it's trying to track um, its actual own activity in the ventricle, and then you end up with this V-paste here. So once again, we're no longer tracking. We're in a non-tracking mode. You have your intrinsic activity. You can clearly see here now the far R, 
rhythm has completely slowed to match the ventricular. That's a dead indicator that this is um, this is far R. Obviously, this is an EGM. It's much easier to see live because then you can modulate the rate. And if you see these atrial events um, continue to occur based on your ventricular rate one to one, this indicates that it is far R. So what can you do to uh, to address this issue? You can lengthen PVAB to cover the far R. You can also uh, decrease the sensitivity of the atrial channel, but things to be aware of when you decrease that sensitivity, um, you know, you're raising that little threshold here. If you raise it too high, you may block out the intrinsic atrial events, and then you are effectively no longer seeing what's happening in the atrium. The device is no longer able to track. Um, any Anything to add on that one, Jared? No, man, that's really nice. Really nice example. Um, you may look at that EGM and think that the patient has programmed uh, very long from that A sense to the next V pace. It looks very long. It's 340 milliseconds. So you could be mistaken that perhaps this patient has programmed long AV delays. But what we're seeing here is a bit like before with that wanky back phenomenon is that we see the, the pacemaker, the ventricular rate is just pacing at the uh, upper tracking rate of probably 120 beats per minute. It's about just under 500 milliseconds there. So, mm -hmm. um, so yeah, that's why we're seeing these long AV delays because the ventricle will not track the atrium only up until a rate of 120. So it's probably got very normal AV delays, but it may look come across like they're very long, but it's just the device uh, at the upper tracking rate. If that atrial rate think... seemed to go, sorry, man. I was just going to no, say no. that atrial rate got quicker. You would then see that winky back uh, situation that we saw before. Dead on. Yeah, exactly. But because it's actually modulated by the ventricular pace, it's never going yeah. to exceed that uh, that rate there because it's going exactly. to go as fast as a ventricular rate. Um, and then one thing I think that was really nice you pointed out is, is at the max track rate, it is 120. Um, at the max track rate of 120 here, that, you know, you may immediately cue in your head, oh, is this PMT? Well, the reason you know it's not PMT is because of these other true atrial events coming through. So if this was PMT, you would not see these at all. Um, and if there was any kind of intrinsic atrial activity like PACs and stuff, they would be affected by the retrograde. Remember that we're looking, you know, with retrograde conduction, we have the human heart here and with retrograde, it's running from the ventricular pace up into the atrium, right? So it would affect the uh, atrial rate if these were PACs. But because these are nice and um, you know stable here in rhythm, this indicates that this is just intrinsic activity. And these events here are not actually occurring in the atrium at all. They're just a ventricular event that's being oversensed by the atrial lead. It's seeing what's going on and just interpreting it as a true atrial activity. All right, so things to consider for this next one. What rhythm is a patient in? What device type is used? What's occurring on the strip? Why did the device mode switch? And how do we address this issue? All right, let's take a look at this one. So right off the bat, we see ventricular pacing. We see atrial sensing. This tick mark right here on an Abbott device means that it's um, an atrial refractory um, in Abbott high voltage devices. So if you ever see just a tick mark with no AR, that means that it's a high voltage device. If this was a pacemaker, it would say AR. So um, just to clarify that right here. So we have a V pace, we have an atrial sensed event, and we have another atrial sensed event that falls within the refractory period. Um, your EGM channels, your discriminator channel is going to be a far field channel. So this is going to be similar to like a unipolar tip, but this is actually a coil to can vector. And then your other channels are an atrial sense amp and a ventricular sense amp. Really quick, I guess. Uh, Jared, you want to take a shot at what's occurring? I won't put you on the spot if not. No, no, it's cool. I'll have a go. <laughs> so we've got uh, yeah, ventricular pacing. And again, a, a bit like a similar scenario, we probably have some form of uh, either VA conduction or uh, some far field R wave over sensing on the atrial channel. And that's allowing uh, the device to see that AS uh, coming in. So we obviously have some very short. Uh, 
PVABs going on here. And mm -hmm. then the marker after the AS on the atrial channel is then the, uh, the, the bigger of the spikes on that atrial channel is probably just the sinus rate coming through. But that is falling probably in a kind of a atrial refractory period. And it's yeah. not being conducted. So I think, um, and I think that's a fair judgment. So this one I'm, I'm cheating because I actually know the answer to this. Um, this is actually your retrograde. Because it's an uh, EGM, no. it's hard to tell. Um, yeah. because you really can't modulate the rate. If you're in person, you could say, okay, increase the rate to 90 beats a minute. And if these both stay pretty similar, uh, then that indicates that it is ventricular driven. If you start seeing a disassociation between the A's and V's, this would indicate that this is a true sinus. But because this is being driven by, um, by the ventricular event, these are actually... Uh, going to be your far R, and this is going to be your retrograde. So going through it, um, what's it's a dual chamber ICD. We know that because the unlabeled tick mark indicates that it's an ICD. Uh, I knew it was a dual chamber because we have a V-pace. If it was a CRT, you would say BP. Could it be a CRT programmed RV only? Sure. But for now, it's functioning as a dual chamber ICD. Uh, what's occurring there is far R wave over sensing and retrograde conduction. So we got both of them here. Um, why did a mode switch? So it's counting both of them towards the mode switch. When you're double counting two atrial events, eventually um, it's probably going to lead to a mode switch, depending what your mode switch rate is programmed to. What's the issue? Your PVAB is too short, um, and that's causing the device to double count the atrial events. So PVAB will need to be extended to blank out the oversensed events, or you could technically make the atrial uh, sensing less sensitive and try to miss this PVAB or miss this uh, this uh, far R. So once again, here we're seeing an RV pace. We're seeing the ventricular event on the atrial channel with your far R, and then we're actually seeing the retrograde event run backwards through the AV node into the atrium depolarizing the atrium here. Perfect. Yeah, that's a good point. And with that one as well, um, if we were to just only deal with the first little spike by say increasing the ventricular blanking and all the sensitivity, then the device would then pick up these, the bigger atrial signal as an AS. So then, cause we still haven't really dealt with the retrograde conduction part. So we'd probably also have to extend the PVARP to blank out that second component, I suspect would that would happen. So if we dealt with the first component, then the second uh, atrial signal will become an issue. And that's when we could end up with maybe PMT. So we'd have to also extend that PVARP to deal with the second component. That's so dead that's on. So common. yeah, right right now we're in mode switch, so we're safe here. But as, as he's saying, when we leave mode switch, even if we address this, this is what, like about 320 milliseconds. If your PVARP terminates at... 300 milliseconds, you're going to track this and then you're going to have the PMT issue. So without addressing both, this is why PVARP and PVAB are both really important. All right, moving along to ventricular timing cycles. If there's any questions, by the way, once again, feel free to raise your hand in the chat. We can give you uh, permission to talk. We'd love to hear anything that you might have for us. So please reach out. Okay, ventricular timing cycles, maybe. Okay, there we go. Okay. So just as you had blanking and refractory in the atrium, you have blanking and refractory in the ventricle. Um, so your V blanking is to avoid uh, crosstalk, which I'll kind of explain here later. It only is initiated after an atrial pace occurs. It's typically programmed anywhere from 12 to 52 milliseconds or an auto. Um, I'm not as familiar with med what Medtronic uses, but um, what it essentially does is after and atrial pace, it closes the device's eyes, um, and we'll go into why that's important. So V-blanking exists to cover up crosstalk. Um, crosstalk occurs when a ventricular channel senses an atrial pacing output and inhibits the ventricular pace. Obviously, if a patient is dependent, this can be deadly. So you see here on this, uh, on this EKG, their patient has an atrial pacing spike here. The device, immediately senses a ventricular event right after that and withholds pace. But if you look at the EKG, 
there's nothing that is occurring here. There's no uh, ventricular depolarization. So it's basically oversensing its own pacing spike, withholding its ventricular pace, thinking this is a true ventricular sense. As a result, the patient could very well have atrial pacing in perpetuity with no ventricular backup, which can be deadly. Um, here's another example of it. So you'll hear um, crosstalk is technically by definition oversensing of a um, event on one channel um, of a oversensing an event on one channel by the other channel. Uh, typically though, when we talk about crosstalk, we talk about ventricular crosstalk. So that's the one that you're going to see in your IBHRE. This is the one that's going to manifest itself in very dangerous ways with your patient. Um, so it's just things to be aware of. And as a result, anytime we atrial place, the device just closes its eyes to avoid, um, to avoid that. Anything to add on there? No, just, um, yeah, crosstalk, as you said, is a, could have back in the day was a very unwelcoming thing, especially for patients with uh, complete heart block. But most modern devices now, within that kind of uh, crosstalk window, they've introduced this thing called uh, ventricular safety pacing. So if there is any signal detected on the ventricular lead within that very, very small window, then the pacemaker will immediately emit a ventricular paced event um, at a very short AV delay so that you're not pacing on the T wave or anything like that. Um, so yeah, so if you do see an EGM with some very short AV delays and uh, it usually comes up on the marker like VPP or something like that or VSP, um, mm -hmm. it may just be ventricular safety pacing. So just to recap that, yeah, if, if the if the device sees a, a signal within that uh, that's vulnerable period, um, it will have a backup pacing uh, in some devices. That on, and we'll actually see an example of that later. Uh, so I appreciate you bringing that up. That's actually well timed. All right, so we have ventricular refractory period. So this is going to be your VREF. This is going to be the ventricular equivalent of PVARP. Um, it's a relative refractory period, which means the device can still see, but it's just not responding to anything. And the point of this is to avoid double counting T waves. So it's just a certain period of time after a ventricular event where the device um, is not responding and won't double count those. Um, devices also have auto sensing algorithms that can actually change your uh, sensing threshold to try to avoid, which we'll kind of cover in a question from the quiz later. Uh, but these are just ways to avoid these tall T waves that can occur uh, that could be double counted by the device. All right, so scenario three, things to keep in mind when you're looking at CKG, what is the rhythm of the patient? What device type is used? What does VSP stand for on the marker channel? What does VS2 indicate? Why does the device not mark the ventricular event uh, VS2 on the 14 second mark? And then what programming changes should be considered to prevent the non-sustained RV over sensing alerts in the future? Okay, so here's slide one. We'll go ahead and give you a second to look at that. Once again, uh, this is the thing that Jared had brought up, VSP. If you were actually to change the sweep speed on these Abbott programmers, it would actually read VSVP because they're occurring so close to one another. This S just kind of overwrites this ventricle. So even though VSP makes sense for ventricular safety pace, in reality, it's actually a marker channel issue. But you're seeing the device atrial pacing. It's fearing that it may have crosstalk. So it's ventricular safety pacing here. And then you have these other events. I'll let you give you time to kind of interpret it before we get into what's actually occurring. And here's slide two. Here's this 14 second mark. It's asking why is there no VS2 right here like there is there. So Jared, I don't want to put you on the spot. Do you have any thoughts on maybe um, what is happening here with the VSP? Yeah, I think there's a, we can go back to the original slide. Yeah, absolutely. Cool. So, so if we look at the top channel, that's our atrial channel. Um, mm -hmm. And if we look at that very first atrial event, uh, which is marked as an AR in a, in black bold, um, Before, I suspect that. Sorry. 
sorry. Sorry yeah. to j just interrupt you really quick because I just want you to know because you don't know this. Um, a pace on PVC is programmed on for this patient. So the A pace on PVC algorithm, when it sees a PVC, it extends PVARP, um, ignores the atrial refractory, and then 330 milliseconds later, atrially paces. Okay. Gotcha. So, yeah. So I suspect that that first marker is probably the true atrial uh, sinus beat that is then uh, probably conducting down to the ventricle. At the same time, you're getting an atrial paste event, which is probably then falling in that vulnerable window we spoke about in that uh, ventricular kind of blanking window, crosstalk window. So it's V safety pasting. Um, and then the VS, now that could be, that could be a ventricular ectopic maybe. Yep, PVC. Uh, have a look. Yeah, looks like a PVC. And then again, as AJ said, we then, um, and then the second, the third, then we go back up to the atrial again. We've got, uh, looks like another sinus beat, which has fallen in probably some refractory period from that PVC. Yep, that one. Which, because it's fallen in a practical period, it is now just timed out from the previous A paste event. So we have another A paste event, probably at the base rate. Uh, 330 milliseconds. This is the algorithm. Oh, that's the one. Is uh, That's the algorithm there. Right. Both Which of them then, yes. Gotcha. Sorry, Which I'm then atrial... left handed. I'm using my right hand here. So excuse yeah, no, my cool. writing. <laughs> yeah, this is a very complex one. But yeah, that yeah. and then. That AR is the sinus beat, which is then conducting down to the ventricle at the same time we got an atrial pacing, but it's then obviously misread as the, uh, the safety pacing there again. Mm -hmm. And then we get a probably another ventricular topic. Unless, yeah, so that's an A, yep, that's A pacing. Mm -hmm. And then I assume we got another perhaps ventricular ectopic. Uh, yep. That's exactly um, what's occurring. Yeah. And then we're kind of in a vicious circle after that. Yep. But then 100%. eventually it stops and then we get ascent by the pacing. So we get a bit of normalization there for a little bit. And then we get right back into it here. So yeah, uh, dead on. So first NSO, everyone, if you wonder what that is, that is the trigger for the EGM non-sustained RV oversensing, um, which means that it's seeing RV event here um, as a um, possible either ventricular event, but it thinks it may be T-wave oversensing, which is what's cueing that NSR uh, VO event or NSO is the marker channel. Um, excuse me, uh, VSP is gonna be your ventricular safety pace. Remember that it's VSVP that gets compressed on each other. As you said, Jared, dead on, you have your intrinsic atrial event here that occurs, but unfortunately you can't see what occurred, but it's this repeating pattern here. Um, the device saw a PVC, it then puts on a pace on PVC where it waits for the intrinsic atrial event to occur. It then waits 330 milliseconds and atrially paces. You might ask, why does this happen? This is to avoid PMT. It's an algorithm that whenever it sees a PVC, it, um, it ignores what's happening in the atrium, paces the atrium to gain control of what's occurring in the atrium, and then uh, tries to just break that cycle that could be PMT. In this case though, this is a true atrial event, not a retrograde. We atrially pace, this conducts down to the ventricle, but because the ventricular event um, is occurring right around the same time, uh, it's very idiosyncratic, but it occurs around the same time as the atrial pace. The device thinks, oh, this could be crosstalk. I don't want to withhold a pace because crosstalk can be deadly. So I safety pace, which may or may not be in the vulnerable period right here. I don't know. It's up for debate. Um, so it safety paces here, which does nothing. It doesn't evoke any kind of response because luckily the tissue is in refractory, so nothing occurs. You have a PVC occur here. The PVC occurs, the device says, oh man, I better A pace on PVC. So it waits till the atrial event occurs. 
and then H really paces and the cycle goes on and on and on. This is a really complicated example. Um, and we'll post this on YouTube so you can kind of go over it again and I'll show you the answer to it. But um, yeah, you can see this occur. Sometimes you see these little idiosyncrasies where timing cycles just align to create this perfect storm. Uh, so once again, VSP stands for ventricular safety pace. You asked, or it asked why on the 14 second mark, we didn't see a, a VS2 right here. This VS2 on Abbott devices is just when it's confirming what's happening on the near field as what's happening on the far field to say, is this noise or is this truly occurring in the heart? So it looks at the near field channel. It looks at the far field channel. If it sees it on both, it says, oh, this probably isn't noise. This is probably legitimate. This one here, there is neither a mark on the ventricular channel here and there's not a mark on the VS2. That is because this falls into complete refractory and um, is not sensed at all. So it fell completely into the, uh, the ventricular blanking period here. It ignored the entire thing um, and nothing occurred as far as the device is concerned because this is in your V blanking. Interesting case, but here, let me show you this again. And like I said, this will be on YouTube so you can pause it and, and watch or read the description of what's occurring. Um, so what programming changes can we do? We can turn off a pace on PVC. I typically don't use this algorithm a lot anyway because it causes stuttering um, quite a bit where every time, if they have a lot of PVCs, you'll end up with this big pause and then a pace again. And then inevitably, um, at least in the US, somebody will call me, um, would call me in from the telemetry to ask why the pacemaker isn't functioning correctly. And then I have to explain to them that it's an algorithm that's doing it. Uh, so I tend to just leave it off if we can avoid it. Um, however, in patients with extremely long retrograde conduction, say their retrograde is 400, 450 milliseconds, you may have a lot of trouble programming your AV delays around it, or sorry, your, your PVARP around it. And in those cases, you may just need to uh, to turn on these special algorithms like APACE. Lost my mouth, so I'm just going to use this. Any questions for me or any comments on that, Jared? No, man, that's a that's a that's a doozy. That's a good one. Yeah, it's a it's an interesting one. And if you have specific questions to the rest of the group on this event, I'm happy to sit down on a one on one um, or as a group, and we can talk through it again. And I can also look up more examples if you want to see them. Um, unfortunately, all my examples are Abbott devices, but it does occur in all devices, so. Uh, keep an eye out. If you ever see interesting cases, feel free to, to forward them along to any of us to review because um, it could be something that we can share to the group and how we can all learn together. So here's the quiz. Uh, for those of you who answered, I really appreciate uh, you participating. We're going to go over the answers to the quiz. So first one, a DF4 lead will fit into an IS4 port. That answer is true. However, an IS4 lead will not fit into a DF4 port. And the reason being is that if you, uh, the DF4 port actually gets more narrow. So where this pin actually plugs is more narrow here. And you can see that reflected on the DF4 lead as well. It narrows here at the tip. This will avoid you getting confused and sticking an IS4 low voltage lead into a high voltage port. Uh, however, it can be advantageous if you're trying to downgrade um, you can actually put a, sorry, sorry. Uh, yeah, DS, DF4 lead will fit into an IS4 port. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So yeah, if you're trying to downgrade, you can, however, put a DF4 lead into an IS4 port because the IS4 lead maintains this thickness. This lead will plug into it. It's just a way of avoiding confusion here. Um, and then you don't run the risk of having put a low voltage lead thinking that the lead is where it's supposed to be. The device tries to defibrillate and it has the small electrode surface area. It can't possibly deliver enough charge and the patient will not be defibrillated. Um, plus it might cause some damage to the circuitry because it's trying to unload a lot of electricity through a very small electrode. So um, if you're trying to stick a DF for lead into a port and it's really not fitting, maybe take another look at it and see, is this the correct port? So or IS for lead. Any questions on that? No, I learned something. Yeah. 
what we try to do. Okay, things to keep in mind about unipolar pacing, sensing configuration. Um, big one here, it will not capture outside of the body. So if for some reason, you know, the pacemaker is not capturing and you realize that you're set to unipolar, you want to either stick it inside the tissue, stick it to a metal instrument that's touching the body. And I've seen like a wet rag placed on top of the chest also uh, work as well. So just remember that if a device is programmed um, unipolar pacing and you're doing, say, for example, a gen change, as soon as the physician pulls the device out of the pocket, the device is no longer capturing. And if this patient is dependent, you're going to have a really bad time. So uh, just be ready with, with whatever you're, you're going to be doing here. Um, uh, some devices too will go into a unipolar mode. Um, if, for example, you cartery over the device itself, you tend not to see that anymore. It happened more with older devices, but um, just keep that in mind. Before you do any kind of gen change, always check the polarity. That's one of the most important things you can do. Um, can it, it can also stimulate the muscle tissue. Just remember that your anode is the device itself and the electrical pathway is running up to the anode. So you can kind of depolarize any tissue across here and you may see pectoral stimulation. Um, and then also if you're sensing at this vector, because your antenna is this big wide antenna, you're not only going to pick up the intrinsic activity of the heart, but you could also pick up the muscle um, activity, any kind of muscle activity between the tip and the device itself. So you could pick up pectoral um, movements as well. Um, so I try to avoid any kind of unipolar sensing if I can at all help it, especially in the dependent patient, because you're going to get over sensing most likely, and you're most likely going to inhibit pacing when you need to actually pace. Um, so properly um, implanted, you would expect unipolar impedance to be lower than bipolar impedance. Remember that impedance is the um, is the amount of resistance on a circuit. When you're going to a tiny electrode, you have more resistance because it's just pin, it's just like little electrode, a little electrode versus when you're running all the way up to this large anode, um, you're going to have less resistance because you have a lot of surface area for this to run through. Also, you're running through a lot of tissue and then can disperse a little bit as well. Um, so things to keep in mind, if you have a higher impo uh, higher impedance on a uh, unipolar vector, you could be outside of the cardiac tissue. And that's a nice little test when you're PSA testing and you think, oh, we may or may not have perfed if they switch the polarity and they go from unipolar or from bipolar, um, which let me show you the pins again. If I can, my mouse is gone. Um, if they switch the polarity and instead of going from, uh, for example, on this lead from the tip to the ring electrode, uh, instead, they go tip and then to skin, and the impedance increases. That could indicate that you're actually outside of the heart with the tip of the lead. So it's just a little indicator. It doesn't always capture it, but if you do see it, um, it's a red flag to consider as possible perf. Any thoughts on that, Jared? No, totally agree, mate. Sweet. Okay, uh, this is just a little, I don't know. For Abbott devices, you do have LV sensing as an option for an LV or for an Abbott pacemaker, um, but not for Abbott ICDs. So if for some reason, you know, you're having trouble with your RV lead, you can still use your LV vector. Just remember that stability is not generally not as good in LV leads, especially newly implanted LV leads. So if you just put it in, if you just added an LV lead, and then you change that to your sensing vector for a dependent patient, if that drops into the atrium, then you're going to have trouble here. It's going to sense atrial activity and withhold pacing when you may actually need it. So I tend not to use it. Um, and when I do, it's when I'm very sure that the LV lead is stable. Okay. Um, so where's the anode and bipolar pacing? Well, um, it's on the ring. Everyone who answered that question got it 100% correct. So uh, yeah, your anode is on the ring with bipolar and then with unipolar, your anode is the can itself. Pacing output is expressed as, I think pretty much everyone got this answer correct too. Um, it's amplitude and pulse width. So your amplitude is your voltage, your pulse width is your time. Um, and I thought this is actually kind of cool. A lot of times it's expressed as a simple um, square here, but it's actually, you have this 
de uh, this decay of of energy. So when you first administer voltage, it's not like you're not administering five volts all the way across the board. It's five volts with the initial uh, leading edge, and then with the tail edge, it may be half of that. Uh, doesn't really matter as much with stimulation on uh, pacing, but when you start talking about defibrillation, you see this same kind of curve. Um, and it's even more so because defibrillators are delivering a ton of energy and you just can't deliver as much over time. So uh, that's when it really starts affecting um, uh, is in defibrillation. But just remember that it's amplitude or voltage and pulse width or time. Um, you can kind of see that too with the strength and duration curve as well. Pulse width is your time, uh, voltage here, and you're trying to find the ideal output uh, playing with that there. All right, raising the threshold um, makes the device less sensitive. A good way of thinking about this is your threshold is like a fence. If your fence is high, you're not able to see as much intrinsic activity that's occurring. You can lower it to allow atrial or to allow sensing of this case, this is actually a QRS, um, intrinsic activity. But if you lower it too much, you may end up over sensing T waves. So uh, certain companies have have created algorithms that um, are not just this flat line sensitivity. Uh, this one is called Sensibility by Abbott. Um, I, I'm sure other manufacturers have something along those lines. I just don't have it offhand. But what this does is it actually starts off with a high fence, um, which is going to be about half of your measured R wave um, at six millivolts or less. Um, and then depending what programming setting you have, and then it will decrement over time until it hits the max sensitivity floor. The idea being, why do you have this slow decrement? If you have a T wave, you're hoping to miss this T wave, but then get more sensitive to allow it to uh, pick up intrinsic activity. This becomes more important um, for obviously dependent patients. And then also when you're trying to sense um, it's like intrinsic ventricular activity for tacky devices. So when you're worried about fine ventric like VF and things like that, you don't want to have your sensitivity fixed at 3.5 millivolts because it could be very low. Uh, you could have torsades as well, which can be problematic for any of these algorithms, but uh, things to keep in mind. Jared, you got anything for me on that one? No, it's very, yeah, just, be, just be careful when program sensitivity, especially in a, an ICD, as you say. You don't want to, you don't want to not sense anything, but you don't want to oversense other things as well. So, yeah. And then this can obviously be changed depending on where the T wave is at. If it's a tall T wave, you can raise uh, this higher and then decrement at the same speed. If the T wave occurs later, you can extend this decay delay longer and then decrement later but maintaining the sensitivity. So these are ways you can kind of customize it. Um, if you ever need to talk through it, reach out to one of us, or you can actually call uh, the tech services of any of these companies and they can talk you through it as well. And then finally, which is typically true um, in regards to lead impedance, uh, these were all false. So um, conductor failures associated, associated with the drop in impedance, it's actually the opposite. You'll see a rise in impedance. Lead mineralization is a sudden jump. It's actually a slow uh, increase, typically, is the way it manifests. And then um, insulation breach associated with a slow rise, it's actually going to be a drop in impedance here. So if you think about, once again, we use that hose uh, metaphor here, uh, normal resistance to uh, to the system here, it just flows normally. If you have a hole or a uh, insulation breach that allows water or electricity in this case to escape through those holes, which means there's less resistance, which means the resistance will drop. If you have a knot or a lead uh, conductor fracture, the electricity can't flow as well across the system, which means you have a, a rise in impedance. Um, so you typically, you know, I kind of gave you these. Uh, also, I would recommend reading this, um, uh, reading this or any number of studies here, or papers here about impedance and how you can use that to detect lead malfunction. Um, so I kind of gave you these examples here. Here's your steady uh, decline. This is because there is probably a, um, a insulation breach. 
Here you have a sudden jump here above 3,000 ohms and then drop back. This indicates a conductor failure. And the fact that it drops back to normal indicates that you're having what's like a make break where occasionally, you know, the patient may stretch and you have a separation of that conductor and then it goes back together. So it functions normally except when the, uh, the conductor wires are separated and then you end up with this jump in impedance. Uh, and then finally, you have this slow, steady increase. Doesn't always mean um, that there is lead mineralization, but it could be an indicator. So this slow, steady rise indicates possible um, mineralization on the lead, um, which is not really much you can do about it. A lot of times, actually, the lead may function fine. Um, so you just want to you know, monitor these leads. And if it's starting to fail, you may need to, um, to add a lead and or extract if that's capable. All right. And that is it. Any questions from the group? Anyone? Any comments, Jared, anything like that? No, I just want to say a big thank you to mate. That was really, uh, really informative. Um, it's, it can be quite daunting, <laughs> um, looking at that and thinking about all these timing cycles, but, um, you know, if you just focus on the basic timing cycles and, you know, just just go through everything in a methodical way. Look at the atrium, look at the ventricle, and just think about what the device is seeing. Um, you know, as clever as these devices are, they're quite uh, simple as well. Mm -hmm. um, they don't think like a human, so you've got to kind of think for them. So um, they simply will think, well, if there's something there, I'm not going to pace. If there's nothing there, I'm going to pace. And if if you just think of it in a simple way like that, then you really have to become the brains of it. So, but just go through everything methodically. Is there an A to every V? And if things are, are blanked out, then think about why they're blanked out, thinking about your PVARPs and your refractory periods and things like that. But um, timing cycles can be very daunting to get your head around, but um, with some time and we're here to support you all. So please reach out and obviously review this um, fantastic talk by AJ. And um, I think it'd be a good, uh, good tool to having your belts uh, moving forward as you learn uh, pacing. Awesome. Yeah, I, I appreciate it. And I, I think that's dead on. I, I had a teacher, my the teacher initially taught me devices. He would always say like, these are very intelligent, dumb devices. They know what they know. So if you don't like the output that the device is doing, if it's acting strangely, generally that doesn't mean there's something wrong with the device. It means there's something wrong with the input. So you have to, it's your responsibility to program around it. I mean, lead failure and things like that can be a factor, but the computer chip itself is very reliable in these devices. So if the output is wrong, if it's acting weird, then you need to take a look at the inputs and adjust that accordingly. Perfect, Jared, I really appreciate you, man. That was fantastic having your insight and keeping me on topic throughout this whole thing. I appreciate everyone else for joining us uh, this week. Um, we'll be back to our regular scheduled uh, physician-led training here uh, next week. So I appreciate uh, you all sticking with me. I'll get this posted on YouTube. And if you have any questions, like I said, reach out to me directly and we can talk through it. But uh, it's been a great Sunday. You enjoy the rest of your day. Thanks, AJ. Thanks, everyone, for joining. Thank you. Take care.